Welcome to the Grow Strong Leaders podcast. I'm your host, Meredith Bell, and I interview business leaders who are committed to their own growth and the development of everyone on their team. If you enjoy my podcast, be sure to subscribe and rate it on your favorite podcast platform. I'm Meredith Bell, your host, and my podcast is sponsored by Our company, we specialize in software tools and books that help people communicate better with each other in the workplace. And today I am so honored to have as my guest, Gary Ridge. Gary, welcome to my show. G'day, Meredith. It's lovely to be with you. Thank you. I am so excited to talk to you and share you with my audience, although very likely they have heard of you. Let me give a formal introduction, though, for those who may not be familiar with you. Gary Ridge is the chairman and chief executive officer of WD-40 Company. And I love that he is passionate about the learning and empowering organizational culture that he has helped establish there. Gary now speaks and coaches with other CEOs to help them build positive cultures in their own companies. He's also an adjunct professor at the University of San Diego, where he teaches the principles and practices of corporate culture in the Master of Science in Executive Leadership Program. And in 2009, he co-authored a wonderful book with Ken Blanchard outlining his effective leadership techniques. And I love the title of this, Gary, Helping People Win at Work, a business philosophy called Don't Mark My Paper, Help Me Get an A. And in 2020, he wrote a book called Tribe Culture, How It Shaped WD-40 Company. And as a matter of fact, I recommended the book just last week when I was doing a presentation about creating a coaching culture. And there were so many excellent points that Gary makes in his book that I had to recommend it to folks that were in the audience. So Gary, what I would love to do is start with your journey to becoming the leader you are today. What are some of the earlier experiences that you had that had a lasting impact on you? Uh, Thank you, Meredith. And, you know, I I really prefer to introduce myself as the consciously incompetent, probably wrong and roughly right chairman and CEO of WD-40 Company, because that better describes who I am. But but thank you for all those other wonderful words. Um, You know, I've been with WD-40 Company. This is my 34th year. I started in Australia in 1987. I opened our Australian subsidiary there. And in 1994, I was asked to move, if I'd like to move to the United States to help with our uh, global expansion program. Back then, the brand was primarily a US brand. It was sprinkled all around the world, but we saw great opportunities outside the US. And I, I disrupted myself. I, I moved to the US with the family and I saw great opportunities to learn more. And then in 1997, uh, the then CEO retired, and I was given the opportunity to lead this wonderful tribe. And I had a couple of aha moments then. I said, well, you know, if we're going to grow globally, micromanagement is not scalable. So we're not going to be able to do it by being everywhere all at once. And I really had a a passion around learning and teaching. Um, i had a lot of mentors in my life when I was growing up in Australia at different places I'd worked that really uh, dedicated themselves to helping me be better at what I did. So I looked around and I found a master in leadership program at the University of San Diego. Uh, In fact, the program that I now teach in, and it was a joint program was put together by Ken Blanchard and the university. And what I loved about the program, Ken Blanchard said, most MBA programs get people in the head. We got to start getting them in the heart as well. And I thought, wow. Incidentally, I was reading some of the work of the Dalai Lama at that time as well. And I read this, our purpose in life is to make people happy. If we can't make them happy, at least don't hurt them. And what I observed was a lot of leaders were hurting people. And it was either intentionally because of greed or unintentionally, probably because of ego. 
And uh, so I went and did that program. I I learned so much from uh, the program around servant leadership. Uh, Ken has been my mentor for many years, and he's 82 years old. And in fact, this week, he and I did a little breakfast stint together at a a local event. Um, So uh, it was really the the crossroad of um, learning and uh, the power of servant leadership and then having the opportunity to practice it. Uh, and get a lot of scar tissue along the way. I'm sure you did. In fact, thinking about what what you've accomplished there at WD40 and your team, I know you're not going to take full credit for it. I'm curious, what was some of the resistance that you met with when you wanted to institute some changes that would help build a more positive culture? What were some of the things that you know, uh, created some obstacles for you? And how did you deal with those? Well, I think one of the biggest fears for leaders in this area is the short-term thinking mentality around performance of companies that a lot have, particularly if you're a public company. You know, Wall Street, think about the last 90 days, and that's about it, Um, where we said we want to build an enduring company over time. And, you know, culture, building a culture in the organization is not about sprinkling fairy dust over an organization and pretending it's going to change overnight. It's something that takes time. So initially, I I think I got a lot of, well, this is the soft stuff. And is this really going to generate the type of, you know, performance we want to, uh, we need as an organization? And, And this stuff isn't soft. This is really hard. It is really, really hard. So um, I think patience and perseverance was very important. Um, Getting really clear on what elements we needed to focus on. And, you know, we put a business together, a model together that said, you know, the first thing you need is the people in the organization. It's all about the people. Then you need a purpose. Why do we all get up every day? You know, people want to go to work at a place where they're going to make a contribution to something bigger than themselves. So, you know, we said, What's our purpose? And our purpose was very clear. Our purpose was to create positive, lasting memories, both with the products that we use and the people that we serve. And then we needed a a compelling set of values in the organization that not only protected people, but set them free. Then we needed to have a, a good strategic plan. We needed to have bold execution. And we needed to become a learning organization. And So we replace the word failure with the words learning moment. We don't make mistakes at WD-40 Company. We have learning moments. And a learning moment is a positive or negative outcome of any situation that needs to be openly and freely shared to to benefit all people. So there was pushback because it was different. I mean, what are you doing, Ridge? You've drunk too much of Ken Blanchard's Kool-Aid. You know, this is all soft stuff. And the other thing that was important at the beginning is to start the measurement. So in 2000, the year 2000, we started measuring employee engagement. Um, and, you know, what I was shocked to see was that many organizations had the majority of their people coming to work, they were disengaged. And Aristotle said, pleasure in the job puts perfection in the work. So if we could bring pleasure in the job to the people, wouldn't it be a better outcome? And that was clear also. So the biggest pushback was this is something new. This won't work. Where's the immediate results? And we had to be persistent and we had to be deliberate. And, but we had to have a model to be able to work with so people could understand it. Well, one of the things that I know a lot of organizations do is they create a set of values. But then they go up on the wall and they don't really reference them. What I love, one of the many things I love about what you've done there at WD-40 is people live those. I mean, you live and breathe those values. So I'd love for you to talk about maybe one or two that you personally feel are some of the most important ones. And how do you bring those to life or how have you brought those to life with people? Yes. um, So Al, you're right. You know, the times that I get really scared is when I walk into organizations and the first thing they do is show me a plaque and say, these are our values. But when you walk around, there's no evidence that people are acting the values. So firstly, 
the big thing that we did is we embedded our values in our talent development program. In the book that I wrote with Ken Blanchard, which talks about how we want to help people get A's, part of the quarterly conversation we have with people is give us examples of how you lived our values in the last 90 days. Real life examples, because people have to embed them. The, the story I love to tell, which I think is really a, a beautiful execution of values, is our values, firstly, are hierarchical. The first one is more powerful than the last one. Our first value is we value doing the right thing. And our second value is we value creating positive, lasting memories in all of our relationships, our relationships with our tribe members, with our customers, with our uh, shareholders, and even with our competitors. So how did that, let me give you an example of how that put to work. Some time back, uh, I was in a meeting at our company early one morning, and there was a participant, one of our leaders in the meeting, that was not creating positive lasting memories. Um, this person was having a very bad morning, and that was spewing out over, the, over the, the meeting. It was not a good meeting. So at the end of the meeting, I, I said to the person, hey, let, let, let's go for a walk. So we walked out of our building and I, I looked behind a tree and under a car and in a trash can. And of course, this person's got this confused look on their face. So what the hell are you doing, Ridge? I said, I'm looking for you. So what do you mean? I said, the, the you I know and love was not in that room today. What's on your mind? What's up? So then we were able to have a conversation. I said, you know, one of our values is creating positive, lasting memories. And something was blocking that in you today. And that's not normal. So there's something going on that, that we need to really get our arms around and help you let go of. So we had a wonderful coaching conversation. You know, at the end of it, we hugged. And, you know, I, I again, reconfirmed my, my, my care and love for this person. The person went back inside and I noticed that they went and visited a couple of people that were in the meeting and actually went to them and said, hey, I'm sorry, I, I wasn't there today. Um, I had a bad morning. I was got up late. I spilt my coffee. You know, there were all these little things that just to were toxins to, their, to the person and, you know, kind of healed that. And they said, we knew it wasn't you, and I'm glad, you know, you've, you, you're back again. The next day I noticed people going to him and saying, are you okay? Is everything all right? So there's a way where we actually put one of our values to work. What if we didn't have that value and weren't prepared to act on it? That they would, the people in that meeting would have walked out with a, a jaundiced point of view about this person. They may have started to make up stories in the absence of facts and data. You know, it, it could have got toxic. It would have spread. It would have become cultural, you know, bad cultural vibe. But we're able to nip it in the bud based on putting one of our values into action. That's great. Well, let's go back a moment and talk about how you created those values. Who was involved in identifying what they were going to be and how they got worded? And, and sure. even then the sequence they appear now. Sure. Um, when I was doing the MSEL program, uh, there was a specific class that, part of a, this, the class that was talking about the power of values in the organization. And, and actually it was part of the class that Ken Blanchard taught. He was my professor. So after one of the classes, this is 21 years ago, I said to Ken, and I, we, we weren't friends then, we were you know, acquaintances. I said, after class on Sunday, because this class finished at lunchtime on a Sunday, would you mind coming with me and speaking to a group of my leaders at the company about the power of a clearly defined set of values. And he agreed. So after class, I dragged him to a hotel and I had 20 of my leaders flown in from everywhere. And we talked about the power of a compelling set of values and what they were. So from that group, we started to put together a, a straw man of what could these six values be. So we, we said, this is what we want them to be. Let's now socialize that with our tribe globally and say, hey, would you be proud to be part of a company that had a set of values that looked like this? So over about a six-month period, we actually came up with our, our set of values that everybody had the opportunity to touch, and we put them in place. And um, we force-ranked them, as I said. Our first value is we value doing the right thing. 
Uh, our second value is we value creating positive, lasting memories in all of our relationships. Our third value is we, we value making it better than it is today. Our fourth value is we value succeeding as a tribe at, while excelling as individuals. Our fifth is we value owning it and passionately acting on it. And our final value is we value sustaining the WD-40 economy. Now, as a public company, you would think that last value, which is about generating profit, should be the number one value. But we believe and we've proven that if we act out all the others, the last one becomes a result. So now these are the values that we live by. And we say anybody in the company can make any decision they want without having to quack up the hierarchy if they rely on our values. And we use them every day, every day in so many ways. When we're stuck, it's, well, what about our values? What would we do? And interestingly, each one has an expanded paragraph of what it means to do the right thing. What does it mean to create positive, lasting memories? So certainly our values are the, the foundation of our culture. So thinking about your values and then attracting new people to your company, whether they're in an employee or leadership role, how do you make selections or determine if they're going to be a good fit with your values? Well, we're pretty upfront about that, Meredith. Um, if you were to go to our careers site, uh, the first thing that pops up is our values. And it says, read these values. And if you, are, if you don't think you're aligned with these values, don't call us. We don't want to see you. So um, we really do uh, hire for values. I, I can, you know, certainly... In any particular role, you have to have a certain level of you know, practical competency in the discipline that you have, and we want to get that. But values over, over are the overshadowing um, thing that we look for as we go through the interviewing process and we talk to people. And, you know, it's, it's, I was saying to someone the other day, it's, it's certainly a journey to go through the interviewing process at WD-40 Company because we are really, um, we really do probe into what do you stand for? Interestingly enough, we have a lot of people who come to us who say, I just want to work at an organization. We've heard about your values. We've heard about your culture and, you know, our tribal culture. We call ourselves a tribe, not a team. Because one of the, the things that people want in life the most is to belong. Everybody who's on this podcast today would be able to reflect on the time when they left a party or an organization, or an, even a relationship because they didn't feel like they belong. So we want to create an organization where we truly, people truly do belong. And our tribal promise is a group of people that come together to protect and feed each other. That's our tribal promise to each other. And, uh, you know, as we went through COVID, um, halfway through COVID, we did a, a employee opinion check-in because as we moved from the way we used to work to the way we work now, we wanted to make sure that we were doing what we needed to do not to drain cultural equity um, because that's so important to us. We got, you know, we have a 93% employee engagement. 98% of our tribe say they love to tell people they work at WD-40 company. So in the tribal check-in, you know, all of the numbers came back at, at least equal to what they were when we did them before. But the one that really excited me, here we were in the middle of one of the most uncertain times in that we living now has probably ever been through. And 98% of our tribe globally said they were excited about our company's future. And I went back and I asked why. And the clear answer I got was, if we can get through this together and feel safe, we can get through anything together. And I thought, wow, that's pretty cool. There's so much you've brought up there that I want to explore. I want to go a different way just for a moment. And that is, you mentioned the word safe. And in your, your book, um, the tribe culture book, you talk in the very first chapter about things that leaders do that actually cause them to be accidental soul sucking leaders. That's such a, you know, a sharp term that you can't forget that very easily. And I know that in most cases, they are accidental. But, but you have been able to achieve with your tribe this amazing, you know, high percentage of engagement. What is it that leaders do 
either consciously or unconsciously that caused people to be disengaged and not feel that they're working in a safe environment? Well, yes, you know, I call it the soul-sucking CEO, leadership behaviors that, t- that build toxic cultures. And, and some of these behaviors are unintentional, but some are intentional. Um, and some examples are, you know, the soul-sucking CEO wants to be the master of control. They want to be the know-it-all. They see themselves as corporate royalty. They think learning is for losers, Their ego eats their empathy instead of their empathy eating their ego. They have all the answers. They do not value the contributions of others. They must always be right. When things go wrong, it's not their fault. They build a fear-based culture. They think micromanagement is essential. They don't follow through with their commitments. They let people down and they hate feedback. And these are some of the attributes that either intentionally because ego is driving them or unintentionally because they're not aware of their behavior that actually build these toxic cultures. And I created a a doll called Al, the soul sucking CEO that I give away to people because when I was out speaking publicly after people come and say, I know Al, I I, I said, well, here's a doll, go and leave, leave it on his desk or her desk whichever is more appropriate. More often he's, um, (laughs) as it turns out, simply because there's more of the male CEOs. uh, But on the other hand, you really prescribe what you call a soul enriching leader or CEO. And, you know, I know it's the opposites of some of the things you just described, but I would love you to hear you talk about where you've seen in your own work with the leaders in your organization, with leaders you've worked with, what are some of the things that they do that really do help enrich the souls of other people? I think that's so important. Sure. Um, so, you know, if you think about a, you know, a, a, the opposite to the soul sucking CEO is the servant leader. And they, they involve and love their people. You know, it's all about the people. They're always in servant leadership mode. Um, they, they are connected with an emotional intelligence. They love learning and they love learning moments. Um, they have a heart of gold, but they also have a backbone of steel. So they can be both caring and candid um, at the same time, it, you know, they can be tough-minded and tender-hearted, and that balance is in the middle. They're champions of hope. Um, they, they know micromanagement isn't scalable. Um, their ego is, is swallowed by their empathy. Um, they absolutely do what they say they're going to do, and they do love feedback. Well, this whole ego versus empathy, I want to go there for a few minutes because I think that's such an important distinction. And I'd love for you to think of a specific situation where a person could respond with ego with negative consequences, yet this is what empathy looks like. And here's the different kind of result that they could get. So if you think about ego, ego is it's all about me, me, me. So, you know, you're in a situation and, you know, there's a, solve, a problem to be solved or there's a, 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 an opportunity to be enhanced. And the ego person is, well, it's all about me. I've got the answer. I'm going to take the credit. Um, you know, you don't really need to be involved. The empathy person is, it's all about you. It's how can I help you step into the best version of your personal self? That's why at the company, we don't have managers. Everybody is called a coach. So my, my direct reports, I am their coach. And what's the responsibility of a coach? It's not to be the ego-driven person who wants to run on the playing field, pick up the ball and kick the goal. The coach's job is to be on the sideline, watching the play, in the locker room, talking to the players, looking for the the right plays, encouraging them, and the the coach is never seen on the on the podium. He's not there picking up the prize. He's there applauding the person who's picking up the prize. So there's the difference between an empathy-based coach 
and an ego-based, it's all about me, I have to win. If I don't win, you can't win. That's great. And, you know, I absolutely love that you call your managers coaches because what I hear so often is managers objecting to taking on the role of coaching as though it's one more thing to add to their plate. But from what you're describing, it's a part of who they are in their work with the folks who are their direct reports or anyone in, I guess, in their work unit. Talk a little bit about how have you helped them see themselves in that role of coach rather than manage the traditional manager? Well, I, I you know, I think it, it's, it, on reflection, it's pretty simple. You, if you have, you, you can't do it on your own. So what you need to do is to build a team to help you win. And, you know, if we can help others rise, we rise with them. So it's, that's really what it comes back to is, you know, we need to help people step into the best version of their personal self to be, do the best work they can, to be the happiest they can be. And if they do, you, the coach, will benefit because, you know, you are the coach. It's at the end of the game, you know, if your team continues not to win, the coach is going to be the one that we're looking at, not the team. So, you know, it's a great investment. It's like when we implemented our talent development program that's in the book that I wrote with Ken Blanchard, you know, some of the early conversations were, you, you, you think we have time to sit down at least every quarter for half an hour or so and, and talk to our people about, you know, how they're doing and ask them what they did? I said, so why wouldn't you have time? Don't you think that if that time is invested in helping your people really perform well, your job's going to be better? And it's like, oh, yeah, I guess. I guess that's true. So, you know, it's, it's, it's so counterintuitive because we have been, I guess, brought up or, 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 le- or, or taught to lead in quite an opposite way. You know, command control, you know, you, don't, don't talk to, the, don't find out what's wrong with people. Yeah, we do. We need to ask them, what's on your mind? Are you okay? You know, think about this. Let's say you have someone working in the organization and they're in, the, in a sales role and they're missing their sales target. You know, is the, which conversation's better? Why are you missing your sales target? You're not working hard enough, blah, 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 blah. Or this one, hey, I've seen you've missed your sales target a couple of months in a row. What's getting in your way? Is there something happening that I can help you with? Are you, you know, let's talk about this. And I think that's what the coach's job is, to remove the roadblocks, take away the barriers, give the field of play, you know, plenty of room for the, for the people to play. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so great. And I like your emphasis on questions where you're not making assumptions but you're really truly trying to find out. I know also in your book, you talk about, and you've mentioned it already today, the distinction between a tribe and a team. And in in coming up with that term of tribe, you did a lot of studying of different tribes around the world. And I'd love to hear about what were some of the elements that you felt were really important to incorporate into the culture you wanted to create? Yeah, thank you. And, and the Indigenous Australians and the Fijian Islanders were two of the tribe, tribal groups that I looked at. And, and it, here, here's a real example of, of the importance of that. So if we were to go back in time, in a time bubble, and find ourselves in the middle of my home country, Australia, observing a group of Indigenous Australians at a tribal meeting, you'd see them all sitting around a fire. And the, what would the tribal leader be doing? The tribal leader would be teaching them to throw a boomerang or a woomera, which were the two weapons they used way back then, and they were the tools of survival. Because if they weren't competent at using the woomera or the boomerang, their chances of survival were low. So what that told me, and I got the same type of feedback when I spoke to the tribal leaders in Fiji, is the number one responsibility of a tribal leader is to be a learner and a teacher. We have to be continual learners and continual teachers to ensure that those we lead have the competency and the ability to be able to survive. So that 
that was the absolute biggest learning. So our number one, the number one responsibility of a tribal leader is to be a learner and a teacher. And that's what we talk about all the time. And that's why we call our managers coaches, because they're there to learn and to teach. And that's why we say we're a learning organization. That's why we don't make mistakes. We have learning moments because we want the fear of failure to be removed. So the freedom to learn can be there. Mm -hmm. I would think that having that learning moment as the framework gives people a sense of freedom to try more things. Do you find that your folks are more innovative in even suggesting or trying things without the fear of negative repercussions? Of course, because, you know, they don't have that fear of, oh, that won't work. I mean, yeah, and there's two types of learning moment. There's the acceptable learning moment and the one that's less acceptable, you know, and the, the one that's less acceptable is the one that, is obviously a learning moment that is made by someone who has a high degree of competency in a certain area. And I wouldn't call that a failure. I would call it a mistake. But then there's the other learning moment, which is the one you're talking about in the areas of creativity and innovation, where you're kind of testing things and trying things. And and you can walk around our company or be on a call and in, in, in teams or wherever around the world and you will hear, hey, I had a learning moment. Here's what it was. Or this was my learning moment. Or what was the learning moment from that that we can take forward? So again, it puts that sincere, authentic, positive tone on let's make sure we're flushing this out. Let's make sure we're understanding it. Mm-hmm. You know, when we went through COVID, uh, I, I, I have it here. I have a, a page full of learning moments that I had during COVID. And here's the list, because I, I, I don't want to forget them. Mm. How often do you review it? It was on my desk. <laughs> so it's always in, in, in view, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. My number one learning moment was in times of great and real need, we can pivot around fear because As soon as the COVID switch went off, fear became big. But we had great and real needs, so we were able to pivot around that, which was really great. The other one that I I love is um, recognise that everybody is going through their own personal hero's journey. So the person that we said see you Monday morning to back in March 2020 that we're now maybe re-engaging with personally in an office that, we, that we haven't been in for 19 months is not the same person. And the big difference is we didn't have those little tiny interactions as much along the way to be able to track their hero's journey. So going back after COVID is not switching the switch on. It's like a dimmer switch. We turn it up a little bit, turn it back, turn it up, turn it back. Because if you were to turn the light on full, it will startle people because they've been through so many different things. Mm. That's so powerful. And to me, it just illustrates your desire to really meet people where they are and and be responsive to them. I know you're very proud and rightly so of the engagement percentage. You mentioned 93% and then 98% said they're happy to tell others. I would love for you to describe what is it that they love about working at WD-40? Why do you get such high scores? What is it they get to do in your company that people in other companies aren't able to do? Imagine a place where you go to work every day. You make a contribution to something bigger than yourself. You learn something new. You're set free and kept safe by a compelling set of values and you go home happy. That's what we envisage at WD-40 company because happy people create happy families, happy families create happy communities and we need happy communities because we need a happier world. So is there a clear purpose? Is there safety? Are they going to be learning? And are they treated with respect and dignity? Our four pillars, care, candor, accountability, responsibility. If you come to WD-40 company, we care about you. We care about you enough to not only applaud you and and, and reward you when you do great work, but also we care about you enough to redirect you when 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 you need to have redirection. Because culture equals values, 
plus behavior times consistency. So we know what our values are, but around the behaviors, we need to applaud people for great behavior, but it's our responsibility as leaders just when they need a little redirection in a caring and sharing way to redirect them. So care is very important. Candor, no lying, no faking, no hiding. I believe most people don't lie. I believe most people fake and hide because of fear. So our learning moment takes that away is we want to reduce fear, give people a circle of safety, show it, show that we're vulnerable because we're all vulnerable. And then accountability. Most people let people down because there's no clear understanding of what we're going to hold each other accountable for. So what do I expect from you? What do you expect from me? And how are we going to have that conversation to ensure that, you know, we're, we're not letting each other down? And then responsibility. We're going to hold ourselves responsible so we don't have the finger pointing and all the other stuff that normally goes on. So it's all those elements wrapped together from that model that I described early in our conversation, people, purpose, values, strategy, execution, learning moments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to ask you about those four pillars, so I'm so glad you brought them up. Because to me, when you were talking earlier about the hard versus soft, I was thinking about those um, two pillars of caring and candor and the fact that it's balanced. And I like the way you just uh, described them. I'm, I'm imagining somebody being in your organization <clears throat> And they've made a mistake and how different that fear feels than in another company where they wait for the boom to drop. And so when if you're thinking about, you know, let's just say, because I know you you do coach other CEOs now, what are some of the key things that you help them um, I guess recognize or even see, become more aware of? that they simply had no idea were things they were doing that were creating problems? Well, you know, the first question I'd ask them is, are you being the person you want to be right now? And who is that person? So we would have a conversation around that, that person. You know, I, I ask myself that, that, that question every day um, because in leadership, we will be pulled off the road of where we want to be very easily because of the influences we have. So what, and then I ask the question, what do I want, what do I want to be? And in my list, I say, I want to be caring. I want to be empathetic. I want to be reasonable. I want to be a listener. I want to be fact-based. I want to be balanced. I want to be a curious learner. And I want to throw sunshine, not shade. So, you know, if a leader can just describe what they want to be and, and then keep questioning themselves on that, that's, the first road. Marshall Goldsmith wrote a great book called What Got You Here Won't Get You There. My favorite one, of his. <laughs> I use that uh, book in the class that I teach at USD, you know, the 20 bad habits. I have each one of them in some degree of abundance. And I'm so happy that I've realized I do have them because now I realize that I have them. I can do something about changing that and reminding myself that. But, you know, I, what I love about my life is I get to wake up each day to do something that I love. I get to inspire people to create positive, lasting memories. It's the most wonderful thing in the world. And the best part of it is trying to find all the different ways to do that. Because at the end of the day, the memories are all we're going to have left. That's beautiful. Now, there's something else you haven't mentioned yet that I know you've said your three favorite words that you like to say. Know. Yes. Talk about that. So, you know, one of the, the learning moments around that was um, I was in the United States. I just arrived. I was in a meeting and someone was up talking about an, an outside person was in the company talking about a particular subject. And I was sitting there and I thought, I have no idea what you're talking about. I'm not sure why you're trying to camouflage this issue with confusion to make out how smart you are. It was just so complex. So I put my hand up and said, excuse me, I do not know what you're talking about. I have no idea. And what happened in the room, everyone went, because ah, no one else did either. And then I learned the power of these three words of saying, you know, I, I, I don't have the answer to that. I don't know. And it's amazing when you, really admit you don't know in a true authentic way 
a lot of people think that people's opinion of you drops. It actually goes up because it's say, okay, now I can learn. We can learn together. So, um, yeah, the three most powerful words I've ever learned in my life is I don't know. And by having those three words, I have learned so much because I've opened, opened up the door to learning. I would think that just some of the behaviors you're describing, including saying that, I'm thinking of the ripple effect that has throughout your organization because it makes your other senior leadership team and other leaders in the whole company be okay with acknowledging they don't have all the answers. And, and I think that would help. It, it, it contributes to that uh, sense of safety mm -hmm. that you were talking about, that when somebody feels like, oh, I don't know, that it's okay to acknowledge that instead of try to cover it up. And, you know, when I introduced myself, I said, I'm the consciously incompetent, probably wrong and roughly right chairman and CEO of WD-40 company, because I am. I am probably wrong and roughly right in most circumstances, and that's okay. That's okay. So what is your vision for the next stage for WD-40? What are you, because I know you are, you know, a visionary leader. Where, where, what's the next level for you as a company? Well, you know, we've got so much opportunity in front of us. There's still a lot of squeaks in China and a lot of rust in Russia. And we're just the boys and girls to take care of that. So, you know, we've grown um, five times our size in the last 20 years. And we now have 65% of our business outside of the United States. We grew our revenue last year by 19%. Here we are in the worst, you know, uncertain times ever. Um, so we're going to continue to do that. But more importantly... By sustaining the WD-40 economy, we're going to be able to continue to nurture the leadership principles that we rely on, which is a group of people that come together to protect and feed each other. That's beautiful. So as we wrap up, Gary, I want you to think about my listeners who are in leadership roles. What's one or two uh, key points or truths uh, or insights that you would like to share with them? It's not about you. It's about the people that you get the chance to help rise to a level that they can to. So as leaders, that's our job. But Simon Sinek says leadership's not about being in charge. It's about taking the care of the people in your charge. And as Bob Chapman says from Barry Weinmiller, everybody that walks in your door is someone's precious child. But I'll add to that. Everyone that walks in your door is someone's precious child, husband, wife, brother, sister, auntie, uncle. And never before in history has business have the, had the opportunity to make such a positive difference on the world as it does now, because we touch so many people every day. So that's how, what we need to do. And we can. We can do it. It's not easy. It's a lot of fun. And the 95-year-old you, when you're lying there on your deathbed, it won't be anything about the office you had or the Mercedes Benz that you drove. It'll be about the memories you have of the people you touched along the way. Thank you. Thank you, Gary, for being a really remarkable human being who's growing, learning, always expanding. That to me makes you so, um, your message so appealing and believable because you're not trying to position yourself as a, a guru. You're a guide, you're a learner walking alongside the folks that you're, you're leading and you are having such an impact in the world. So I want to thank you so much for thank that. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I want to, again, recommend both of your books, Helping People Win at Work with Ken Blanchard and Tribe Culture, your own book. And would you like to um, let people know how they can connect with you and also learn more about the work you're doing? Sure. And there's another book that just came out a couple of months ago called The Unexpected Learning Moment. And it's about leading a tribe through covid so that's also out there now as well. And uh, oh, I must make good. sure I send you one. But yeah, I'm on LinkedIn. That's where you can find me. I, I write blogs. I 
I share learning on there. And then I have a website, www.thelearningmoment.net. And uh, that talks about some of the work we do. Uh, and I have a book recommendation list on there of things that I've learned. So any of those places, uh, you'll find me. Great. And we will put those links in the show notes page when we publish your interview. Gary, thank you again for being my guest today and for the wonderful work that you are doing in this world. Thank you for helping people learn more about how we can be better leaders. Thanks for tuning into my podcast. Now head over to growstrongleaders.com and check out our two books, Connect With Your Team and Peer Coaching Made Simple. While you're there, download the free facilitator guide to find out how to implement our unique peer coaching system. Until next time, I'm Meredith Bell.